evening and welcome. Tonight we will be continuing our read through of this book, History of the World, Map by Map. I'm filming this in the daytime so it might be a little shadowy, but uh, tonight is the Reno Rodeo, so I live close enough to the fairgrounds that you can hear it like I'm it like I'm actually there. It's very loud, which is not a bad thing. It's very exciting, but I either have to film at like four in the morning when it gets quiet or in the daytime. So I'm trying in the daytime, so hopefully it's not too loud outside. But let's get into the history maps. So I know this video is titled, actually I don't know what it's titled yet, but it's probably Colonial America or Colonial United States or something. Because um, I, I, if you don't know, I, I haven't read these maps in advance. The whole point is that we're going to read them together. So I'm not quite sure what I'm going to title it until I've read them. Uh, but I have this map for you first about the Dutch Golden Age, which doesn't really fit into any themes. And we are going to talk about, you know, their colonies in the Americas, I assume. So we're, we're just going to throw it in here and learn about uh, when the Dutch were at their peak in terms of colonialism and world power. So let's see. Let's see what we've got. Because, yeah, I don't, I've not read any of these maps beforehand. So let's explore them together. We start with the Dutch economy and politics, 1602 to 1700. The need to finance foreign trading expeditions led to the foundation of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange in 1602 and to the Bank of Amsterdam in 1609. Both were able to provide investment funds and loans at much lower interest rates than foreign competitors. Statesmen such as Johan van Olden Braunveld and Johan de Witt provided the able leadership and political stability for the new United Provinces. And then we have the Dutch East India Company from 1602 to 1799. The VOC was established in 1602, financed by 6.5 million florins put in by investors and governed by a board of 17 directors in Amsterdam. The establishment of a base on Java in 1619 and the forceful direction of the VOC's governor-general in the East Indies enabled it to marginalize the Portuguese in the Spice Islands and dominate the Indonesian archipelago and until its dissolution in 1799. The headquarters of the VOC are, of course, in... Well, I thought it would be in Amsterdam. Okay, I guess not, of course. It's in Batavia, <laughs> down here in Java. It's in Batavia. That makes more sense than Amsterdam, but said it was ruled from Amsterdam, so... Okay, so not, of course, in Amsterdam, like I was about to say. The headquarters was Batavia. I thought that was just, like, their principal port. I didn't realize it was ran from Batavia. Interesting. I already learned something today. The Dutch in Africa, 1592 to 1814. Dutch voyages to West Africa began around 1592. Unsuccessful attempts to seize Elmina, which they finally took in 1637, led to the establishment of Fort Nassau in 1612 and served as the capital of the Dutch Gold Coast. By the 1640s, the Dutch were threatening the Portuguese base in Angola, and in 1652, an outpost was set up at Cape Town at the southern tip of Africa. Cape Town received significant numbers of Dutch settlers and remained in Dutch hands until 1814. Then we have, can we see, I try to do this angle again to try to incorporate as much as I can. I think you guys can see. The Dutch in Australia and New Zealand, 1606 to 1642. After being the first Europeans to sight Australia's coastline in 1606, the Dutch extensively surveyed its west and north coasts. Willem Janssoon made the first landfall in 1606. In 1642, Abel Tasman sighted Van Diemen's Land, which is now Tasmania, and claimed it for the Netherlands. The Dutch made no attempt to establish a colony on Australia. 
So Abel Tasman's voyages are these pink arrows here. We can see him going all around the West Indies here, uh, through the Torres Strait here, and then around the coast of Australia, Batavia, Mauritius, and then he sailed. He's like, oh, there's a big island there, and to New Zealand, along the coast, back to here. What a journey. And the Australian coastline that was surveyed by the Dutch is outlined in pink here, so it was this entire west coast here they surveyed. Oh, and that's it. Uh, we just have little boxes here on the maps. Let's see, let's see. We have, this looks like there's some lists of areas here, in like New Amsterdam, there's Jamestown, which was British. But let's see what it says here, 1625. New Amsterdam is capital of New Netherland, region of the east coast of America. New Netherland, I don't know. I've never heard that name before. Well, it didn't last long, did it? I'm sure we'll read about that in another map coming up. 1664 was taken by the British and renamed New York. Well, there we go. Let's see if I had read, I would have known. In 1667, it was ceded to Britain by the Treaty of Breda. And in 1655, New Sweden was captured by the Dutch. Let's see in South America here. You can see some of their land here along the coast. 1630 to 1664. 1654. Recife is the capital of Dutch Brazil until it was recaptured by the Portuguese. 1630 to 1654 also. Pernambuco was attacked by the Dutch fleet and occupied. And 1623 to 1625, Salvador was captured by the Dutch. They really tried to give Brazil for a minute there. Let's see, we've got some islands there. There's Goree Island, and what's now Senegal. Um, we've got little forts there, like they said, Elmina Fort, and what's now Ghana. They're going to talk about it here. It says 1637 to 1871, Elmina is captured and becomes the capital of the Dutch Gold Coast. St. Helena was Dutch? Well, wow, I didn't know that. Um, Angola. Oh, there's Luanda. It's 1641 to 42. Luanda was captured by the Dutch. In 1652, the Dutch settlement was established there in Cape Town. Um, over here in Gamron, which looks like it's in the Safavid Empire there, the Dutch established a factory in Gamron. 1623, it's now Bandarapa. 1616, the Mughals grant the Dutch right to trade in Surat era. You can see all their little fortifications there. They had Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. Um, and then what else? Formosa over here, which is now Taiwan. 1641, oh, I skipped one, but let's, oh, let's just read this. 1605, Dutch established a fort, helping them to monopolize the textiles trade. Where is that Pondicherry is that I was pointing at? Madras? Is that? I can't tell what it's pointing at. It's one of those. Alright, 1641, the Dutch trading post was established in the Bay of Nagasaki, the single place of direct trade between Japan and the rest of the world during Japan's Edo period, which I think we talked about in the last map series we did. 1607, the VOC receives monopoly of the clove trade in the Moluccas Islands, known as the Spice Islands. 1605, forts captured from Portugal, developing Dutch dominance in the Spice Islands. Looks like it's pointing at, what does that say, Embon? I'm not sure. And that looks like it. The rest is just pointing out little areas that the Dutch controlled. Interesting, interesting. All right. Now that that's out of the way, let's head over to the Americas. North America, at least. So we're starting off with Battle for North America. I assume this is about what we call America, as we call it the French and Indian War. I assume that's what this map is about, but I don't know. Let's find out. Um, starting up here, I have to squish this into my gut to read it. All right. The French vie for domination, 1700 to 1750. French colonists claimed and began to settle a vast expanse of North America, from the Mississippi Delta in the south to the northeastern coastline. 
with the fur trade forming the mainstay of their economy. By 1750, rising tension over British encroachment into Midwestern territories of Butting, the Great Plains, had resulted in the French erecting a series of forts. They also formed friendly relations with tribes such as the Huron and Odawa to help them fight the British threat. Well, my mouth really tried to say fort because I was looking at this British threat. So all of these blue forts here are French, and my goodness, they had so many, I didn't realize how many French forts there were way out here, really trying to assert their dominance here and not letting any British people expand further west. Huh? And then, of course, they had their big spots up there. Interesting, interesting. And French trading posts are blue triangles, and you can see that there's just they're just everywhere. <laughs> they're all over the place. They are all over. Well, well, well. Which makes sense, because there is a lot of fur to be traded out there. Lots of wild animals. Let's read about Queen Anne's War, 1702 to 1713. I, sorry, this is like in my gut. <laughs> this book is in my stomach. Allied with Native American groups, French colonists raided British settlements in the New England colonies. In retaliation, the British captured the key French fortress of Port, Port Royal in the French colony of Acadia. Following the war, mainland Acadia, Hudson Bay, and Newfoundland were ceded to Britain under the 1713 Treaty of Utrecht. Part of Acadia became Nova Scotia, so named due to its brief period as a Scottish colony from 1629 to 1632. I get this out of my gut. <laughs> All right, French campaigns are solid, kind of, are they that brown? I guess it's brownish. Um, yes, yeah, solid brown arrows are French campaigns, I guess you can see up here. Um, but the French and Native American campaigns are the dotted, and you can see a whole bunch heading into um, the British colonial territory there. French raids are these explosion symbols. Do we see a little explosion somewhere? Little explosions? Oh, there's a bunch right here. Up in New England. And the British campaigns are these dotted lines, so... The ones going this way are the British ones heading up into what's now Nova Scotia and what was called Acadia. I can see there. Then we have the Iroquois Confederacy. I'm going to turn it this way so I'm not squishing it against my tummy. The Iroquois Confederacy, 1600 to 1779. In 1722, the Tuscarora tribe, displaced from the Carolinas by European settlement, became the sixth member of a League of Nations known as the Iroquois Confederacy, located in Upper New York State. The Iroquois successfully defended their territory until 1779, when an American force carried out a systematic destruction of Iroquois settlement and crops. So the Iroquois Confederacy was marked by this, which was just right here. I thought it was way bigger. I thought it was closer to the rest of the Great Lakes, kind of like, I thought it was like this area here, but it's much smaller than I thought it was. I don't know, whenever I think of the Iroquois, I think of the Great Lakes, but it looks like they were only bordering Lake Ontario, so I gotta change my perception of the Iroquois Confederacy. So I wish there was more about them, because they're, they established like a system of government that the founding fathers of the United States borrowed in writing the Constitution, which obviously um, affected the whole world because many, many, many other countries uh, modeled their constitution after the American Constitution in the like 1800s, you know. It's a very interesting, the Iroquois Confederacy. Let's read about the War of Jenkins's Ear. I have never heard of this. The War of Jenkins's Ear was from 1739 to 1748. The conflict between the Spanish and English over the land between South Carolina and Florida had been simmering for a century. However, the hostilities found a new edge with English naval captain Robert Jenkins's claim that Spanish coast guards had pillaged his ship and cut off his ear, which he presented to Parliament, ew, triggering a nine-year war with Spain, which eventually became mixed up with King George's War. Wow, I have never heard of this. 
Well, the Spanish is this solid green line. You can see them coming up from their colonies here in the Caribbean, from Havana here, attacking the coast of Florida and the Carolinas. The British campaigns are the dots, so it looks like they went from Savannah down here to Florida to these, I assume these are Spanish forts. Yeah, the Spanish forts. And major battles are these swords, so we can see right here, looks like it's called Bloody Marsh, which I bet it's named after the battle. Let's read about King George's War, which I've heard of, but I don't know a lot about. King George's War, 1744 to 1748. It says, in 1744, the French and British were at war in Europe over the Austrian succession. King George's War was the name given to its French and British theater in North America. The war resulted in the British American colonists taking Louis Louisburg on Cape Breton Island. How do you? I've never heard this place. It looks French, so I assume it's Louisburg. I do not know. Um, any New England people, let me know how to pronounce it. However, under the terms of the 1748 peace treaty, the British returned Louisburg to the French, a move that infuriated the American colonists. So the French are solid, I guess that's a maroon line there, attacking up here in Halifax, around Nova Scotia it looks like. Um, the British are dotted, so they came up from their colonies to attack up here. The French raids is this maroon explosion, which, um, explosions, oh, right here. Oh my goodness. And right here. And then the major battle here is the crossed swords there, and that's where Louis, oh, okay. So Canadians, let me know how to pronounce it. Is it Louisburg? I assume it's like in the French part of Canada. I assume it's Louisburg. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Then we have the French and Indian War. Which I think it's called something very different in Canada and Britain. Like, they're, they're very different names. Uh, 1756 to 1762. I guess I'll put this right here. Uh, with French military resources committed in Europe, British colonists took advantage, waging war on their French counterparts. Key victories in Fort Louisbourg, Quebec, Fort Niagara, and Montreal ended French territorial claims in North America, with France ceding Louisiana to Spain in the secret treaty of Fontainebleau. So major battles in the French and Indian War are these yellow crossed swords. We can see there's Louisburg again. Can you see? Louisburg again. Quebec. Um, I guess that's Montreal there. And down here, Niagara. Taxation tyranny. 1763 to 1773. In the years following the French and Indian War, Britain passed a series of taxation laws, not only to earn its share of profits from colonial trade in America, but also to recoup the cost of the war. When Britain attempted to gain a monopoly on the lucrative tea trade by enforcing the Tea Act, a group of colonists boarded British tea ships in Boston and dumped 342 chests of tea into the harbor, an act now known as the Boston Tea Party. Very famous event, as you can see right there, shown by these people. I guess they're throwing tea in the water. <laughs> it looks like, looks like they're running, but uh, you can see there. I guess they're hurling tea into the Boston Harbor there. Then we have the First Continental Congress of 1774. In 1774, delegates from 12 of the 13 colonies, since Georgia didn't send a representative, convened in Philadelphia for the First Continental Congress. The delegates agreed that colonists were entitled to the rights of life, liberty, and prosperity, and called on the colonies to stop imports from Britain. As the stance hardened on both sides, the relationship between Britain and the American colonists became irreparable. And this symbol shows us here in Philadelphia, that's where the First Continental Congress is. Just saying that is giving me like 8th grade history flashbacks. 8th <laughs> grade history is supposed to be American history, but it's like 80% Revolutionary War. Um, but let's read all these little boxes here and find out some more. We've got 1704 to 1708, the French raid British colonies during Queen Anne's War. 
1745, the French fortress of Louisbourg falls to Americans during King George's War. 1710, the British troops take the Acadian capital of Port Royal, renaming it Annapolis Royal. That's a worse name. 1745, French forces and their Native American allies raid and destroy the village of Saratoga, killing up to 100 inhabitants. 1774, the first Continental Congress is held in Philadelphia, in which the colonies decide to boycott British imports as a protest against the 1773 Tea Act. Let's head over here to Cahokia, it looks like. In the 1700s, the forts in fertile Illinois country, which is Kaskaskia, Cahokia, and Vincennes, um, become the grain garden of New France. July 1742, the Spanish attempted to invade Georgia at the Battle of Bloody Marsh. That's right. And then it looks like we have one more box down here. 1740, down here in Cartagena. Which is, I guess we missed this, didn't we? My goodness. During the War of Jenkins's Ear, a British colonial raid on Cartagena results in the death of the majority of the raiding army. Wow, yeah, there were battles down here in Panama, too. My goodness, my goodness. I didn't, I didn't even think to look this far down, right? Huh. Interesting. Yeah, battle, the War of Jenkins' ear. How crazy. I wonder if they did cut off his ear or if he did it himself. I wonder if that's like a history mystery. I don't know, I don't know. Alright, we're gonna move on to the Seven Years' War. Which was primarily fought in Europe, but the colonies were greatly involved, so I'm lumping it into this section here. <laughs> um, let me see. Yeah, we're going to do one more map after this, and then um, the nitty-gritty of the American Revolution, I think we'll save for next time. Yeah, we'll lump that in with South America. Okay. Or should we just do it now? I don't know. What should I do? Nah, I'm going to, because then it gets into Napoleon and stuff, so. We'll save the Revolutionary War for next time. Okay. The end of Acadia, 1754 to 1760. Fighting broke out in 1754 between French and British colonists over ownership rights to the Ohio River Valley, which was a key fur trade post. Battles raged for several years, with Native American tribes pulled into the conflict. Eventually, the British captured Quebec, gained control of all former French territory, and expelled the French colonists of Acadia. The British campaign is a solid green arrow, and the French campaign is a white arrow. So we can see the British coming up from Boston, heading over to Halifax. There's Louisbourg again. And then down, I guess, I was going to say the St. Lawrence River, is it? Yeah, the St. Lawrence River to attack all of these French areas. It looks like they went by land from Williamsburg too. Wow. Where's the French? Okay, so the white arrows are a little harder to see, but you can see them coming here, attacking there, and attacking there. And the British came by land and by sea. Look at that. British victories are green swords. French victories are white swords. I see lots of green swords. Lots and lots of green swords. Do you see any white swords? There's one. I feel like Dora the Explorer for a second. Do you see any? Where is it? I only see the one. I'm sure there's others, but I only see the one. And then the French ring of defense are these yellow, I guess, little triangles here. Um, yeah, they like, they guarded like all of this area here, so you can see why the British attacked where they did, right? Interesting. Then we have the Anglo-Spanish War, 1762 to 1763. As French losses mounted, Spain became increasingly nervous about the British threat to its colonies. But before they could launch an offensive as a French ally, the British laid siege to and seized control of the Spanish colony of Havana, Cuba. A month later, on the other side of the world, the British invaded Manila in the Spanish-controlled Philippines. Well, the British came down from the Bahamas here and went after Havana. British victory, you can see there. And obviously the Philippines is not pictured. Up 
Prussia's invasion. Let's head over to Europe. 1756 to 1762. When Prussia's Frederick the Great invaded Saxony, Austria, and its allies retaliated from all fronts. Uh, what? But Prussia... What? Oh, was that a... Wait, what? When Prussia's Frederick the Great invaded Saxony, comma, Austria, and its allies retaliated on all fronts. But Prussia, aided by, Brit baited, aided by British subsidies, scored a string of early victories, notably in 1757 in Luthen against French troops. That was the longest sentence I've ever read on this channel, I feel like. That was infuriating. Oh, sorry if you hear that crackling. I'm probably getting a text of some kind on my phone. Let me, whoa, okay. Hold on, hold on. Yep, I'm getting a, oh, someone's calling me. Okay, hang up. The pharmacy's calling me. Okay, all right, stop now. Okay, there we go. <laughs> the pharmacy was calling me. That can, they can leave a voicemail. But, but issues with filming during the day, right? I get phone calls. <laughs> I wonder why. It was the pharmacy that gave me the prescription for my antibiotic for my finger infection, which you can see is clearing up very nicely. I wonder why they were calling me, but I don't know. Um, back to Prussia. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Prussia's Frederick the Great invaded Saxony, and then Austria and its allies retaliated. But Prussia was aided by British subsidies, and they scored a string of early victories, notably in 1757 in Luthen against the French troops. However, Prussia suffered a heavy loss to Austria and Russia in 1759 at Kunersdorf. Further Russian advances appeared to seal Prussia's fate, but the death of Russia's warmonger, Empress Elizabeth, earned Prussia a timely reprieve. Okay, that sure was a box, wasn't it? So Prussia, you can see there's purple, along with their allies, you can see Hanover's over here. Um, Austria, wait, what? Wait, 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 what? Okay, Austria is kind of grayer. Oh, I guess this is, this color does not look like this color. This color looks purple to me. So Prussia and its allies. We got Prussia, we got Hanover, we got Great Britain. Austria and its allies, of course, Austria and Hungary, they got Saxony, they got Russia, Sweden, France, and Spain, Tuscany, Milan, Corsica, among others I assume I don't see. Um, Prussia's victories are purple swords, which you can see all through here, those British subsidies, and Austria's victories are red, red crossed swords there. Um, the initial campaigns by Austria are these red arrows you can see coming from Russia, coming down here, coming up there. It's all over the place. <laughs> My goodness. The British blockades, 1759 to 1761. The French had planned an invasion of Britain, but their fleet was badly battered in defeats in 1759 at Lagos off Portugal. So, okay. Lagos is in Nigeria. That's Lagos, <laughs> Portugal. Uh, August 19th to 28th. I'm sure Lagos, Nigeria was not even a thing at this time. It was probably something, but not like it is today. But anyway, Lagos off Portugal. That's what happens when I don't read in advance. Okay, and Quiberon Bay off of Brittany on November 20th. While the British naval blockades impaired French supply routes to the colonies. These naval victories enabled Britain to gain an advantage over France in its colonial conquests elsewhere. So they're blockading these areas. In Brittany, which is northern France, and in Portugal. So we can see the naval campaigns are these bright pink arrows. The French ones are these dark pink arrows, which is a little bit confusing. See, there's Lagos. You can see them coming up here on the coast of France. And the French are coming in too. French victories are maroon swords. Um, and over here as well. It's a British victory there, yeah. British victory up there. Then we have the Peace of Paris Treaty in 1763. 
The signing of the treaty in Paris confirmed the end of French imperial and colonial ambitions and the ascendancy of Britain as a world empire. In the war's aftermath, saddled with a huge war debt, Britain attempted to draw revenues from its colonies in North America, much against the wills of the col colonialists, and fomented the beginnings of a rebellion. And here, of course, in Paris is the Treaty of Paris, the Peace of Paris. So yeah, all these wars, Britain's like, we'll just tax the colonists more, they'll just pay more money, and uh, yeah, now I live in the United States. <laughs> Uh, September 13th, 1759, it says General James Wolfe is killed capturing Quebec at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. Wow. 1759, after capturing the key defensive fort of Louisbourg, the British sail up the St. Lawrence and begin deporting all the Acadian colonists. Here at this fort in 1755, at the outbreak of war in the Ohio Valley, General Braddock, aided by Virginia militiamen, commanded by 22-year-old George Washington. I know that guy. He attacked Fort Duquesne. Duquesne. How do you pronounce that? Du Duquesne. Um, 1762. The British, under Admiral Pocock and the Earl of Albemarle, make a preemptive strike on Havana. Albemarle. Let's see, 1759, British naval victory at Quiberon Bay and victory at La Jose secures maritime supremacy. This little box here, it says, In Europe, the Seven Years' War took place on land in the center and east of the continent and in the seas of Western Europe. Some more boxes over here. 1763, Peace of who Hubertusburg confirms a return to the state existing before the war and for Prussia its ascendancy to great power status. Interesting. Um, 1760 Prussian victory at Lignitz and Torgau relieves the threat to Austria. And in 1762 it says ascension of Peter III to Tsar results in peace between Russia and Prussia. What a complicated war, but then again, what war isn't complicated, right? Alright, one more very depressing map, I assume, about the Atlantic slave trade. Since the theme of this video is colonial America, this is probably one of the most important aspects of that time. So let's learn more about it. Portuguese instigators, 1441 to 1455. In the early 15th century, the Portuguese raided the West African coast for slaves to labor on the large estates of the Algarve region, on the mainland, and on the Atlantic islands colonized by Portugal, such as Cape Verde and Madeira. By 1455, around 10% of the population of Lisbon was black. Wow, that early. 1455, wow. So the early slave trade is this green dotted arrow, which we can see coming up from, it uh, looks like what's now Senegal, since there's some of the, up to Lisbon. What was it? It was one of my last Portugal videos, not the one about the Azores, but before that. Who was it? I forget the name. <laughs> it's blank I'm blanking right now. I'll remember in a second. But someone commented, like, how dare you make a video about Portugal? They started the slave trade, and it's like, okay. Oh, they were, they were mad because I didn't mention how the Portuguese began the slave trade which had nothing to do with the region that I was talking about. So I was like, you know, both things can be true at the same time. Like, yes, they started the slave trade. Yes, that was very bad. Obvious, obviously. No one's pro-Atlantic slave trade. But I don't have to mention it every video about Portugal, right? You get what I'm saying. Number two, <laughs> labor for the new world, 1500 to 1866. See, like, negative comments stand out in my mind so much more than positive ones, so go ahead and just drop some positive ones in the comments that are memorable, okay? <laughs> Please do. Uh, Europe turned to Africa to supply hardy labor to work in the mines and plantations of the New World colonies. Slave traders forcibly captured potential workers, including women and children, by the thousands and marched them to fortified centers called factories on the coast 
before placing them on ships bound for the new world. I didn't know they called them factories. That is depressing. Oof, that is rough. Yikes. Okay, so yes, we can see the routes that they took are these green arrows going inland, heading to the coast, where we can see here at Benguela, Luanda. Um, not so Tome, but here on the coast, Waida looks like. Um, well, all along here, and then San Luis was a big one, and Gore Island was a big one. Um, depressing, 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 and the export centers are green, holy moly. Mozambique too, oh my gosh, over here in Mozambique, Zanzibar and Mombasa heading out to these colonies. Oh, that is so depressing. And then of course the routes are these green arrows, you can see also from Mozambique heading over to Cape Town. And then this is the Middle Passage. I'm sure we'll talk about it. Actually, I think this is the next book. Next book. Next box. We're going to talk about these arrows. I'm getting too far ahead of myself. The Atlantic Slave Trade. The Atlantic Slave Trade develops 1500 to 1640. Voyages direct from Africa to the New World started as early as 1500. Initially, the slaves were sent to the Caribbean, only later did they go to Brazil. By 1640, two distinct branches of the transatlantic slave trade, or the TAST, had developed. Following the prevailing winds and currents, the northern one to the Caribbean and mainland Spanish America, and the southern one to Brazil. So yes, we have these green arrows heading over to these green areas where they would be receiving slaves, so like the entirety of Central America, all down the coast here, most of the coast here, Caribbean islands, southern United States, northern United States, and the St. Lawrence River area here in Canada. Gosh, it's so sad. I can't even wrap my head around how absolutely horrendous this process was. Um, we're gonna move on, because, um, I'm gonna get sad. Uh, the Six Imperial Systems. What is this? I haven't heard of this. I also have never heard T-A-S-T -T for Transatlantic Slave Trade. I've never seen it, um, like, in initials like that. Shortened, I guess. 1672 to 1750. By 1672, six empires, which was the British, Danish, Dutch, French, Spanish, and Portuguese, operated TAST to feed the labor demands of their plantations and mines. TAST developed its overarching triangular structure of goods moving from Europe to Africa, slaves from Africa to the Americas, and commodities from the Americas back to Europe. So yeah, completing the triangle trade, these purple arrows here are heading over to Europe. We can see we've got furs, tobacco, dye stuff, sugar, and cotton heading to Liverpool or the coast here. Uh, silver, sugar, cacao, and coffee heading up to southern Spain. Silver, gold, sugar, tobacco, coffee, and diamonds to Portugal. Salt and cod popping over here. This is European exports to Africa. Wow. So I guess these are um, going to get on the ships. We got down here to Haiti and Jamaica. That'll go to Europe and then to Africa. Wild. Yeah, goods exported for slaves is these square dot, so that's these, exported for slaves. My goodness. And then, oh, I see, these are the ones heading to Africa. I see, I see, I see. Okay, so. They're trading these for slaves, salt cod. And then we've got iron cloth shells and guns heading to Africa. And that looks like it. The effects on African polities, 1700 to 1900. In the 18th century, goods and weapons traded for slaves drove the rapid expansion of the West African kingdoms of Oyo and Ashanti. The 19th century saw the rise of Dahomey in Benin and the Chokwe, what's now Angola, and the Democratic Republic 
of the Congo. So we can see the kingdoms here. There's um, Kong, Ashanti, the Oyo, um, Benin is there. Yeah, kingdoms that profited from capturing enemies and selling them to the Europeans. And it would be far too late before they realized, like, oh, the Europeans aren't our allies, like, at all. Um, they, they realized that far too late. Then we have the scale of, of I was like, what's TAST? T-A-S-T, transatlantic slave trade, the scale of it. 1790 to 1830. From the 1790s to 1830, more than 74,000 people a year, oh, a year, from, oh my gosh, were forcibly removed from Africa in slave ships up to 3,400 a year in 1640. Oh, up from 34 and 60. Oh my gosh. Over the next two decades, a further million people were transported. Gosh, around 10% of the entire number of slaves traded. The vast majority of slaves were carried to South America, primarily Brazil and the Caribbean. Where's... Oh, I see. So on these routes, we can see how many slaves were brought. So we can see Brazil is 3.6 million New Granada is 320,000, Guiana is 500,000, Grenada 67,000, Barbados 360,000, same with Martinique, Guadalupe is 290,000, Hispaniola is 860,000, Jamaica is 750,000, Mexico City is 1 million, holy moly, I didn't realize it was that, that many in Mexico City. Here in, I guess, New France, 500,000. Or I guess that's just this whole area in general. Like, I knew Brazil had the, the largest number, but 3.6 million. Vice Royalty of Peru, 95,000. Absolutely devastating, isn't it? Oh. It's just so hard to wrap your head around. Like... And then, of course, you know, these people, if they survive this, are going to even more horrors for generations. Ugh, just easily, like, top three darkest period in world history, right, is the transatlantic slave trade. I mean, there, there's a couple of instances that are just as bad, but this is, this is one of the top worst things to happen in history. Well, I'm very sorry I'm leaving you on such a depressing note. But next time, it looks like we're going to talk about the American Revolution. So that's exciting. Um, you know what I should do? You know what I should do? I'm going to do this next week, because next week is the 4th of July. And we gotta, we gotta. Okay, so I'm going to actually film this next week. I wasn't planning on it. But I think we, I think we have to. I think I, as an American, have to. So I'll do that. I'll plan on that. Okay. Um, I mean, it's too opportune. I gotta. So, anyway. Uh, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this loose, relaxed style of video, um, subscribe because we're gonna do it again next week, apparently. I think I, think I have to. Um, I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a good, 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 good night. I'm going to enjoy the rest of my day before I open the window and listen to the Reno Rodeo going all night long. <laughs> so anyway, good night. Good night. Good night.